So he, he could have had it. He forsook it. Again, it doesn't mean that he can't be saved. Okay, so Jacob leaves. And um, let me just see. Jacob is running. He's afraid of his brother. Because Esau was threatening, I'm going to take him out and kill him. So he, he's running away from Esau to a place that he knows nothing about. And it's here in verse 10 where he has this vision, this dream. And now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head. And he lay down in that place to sleep, which is very common. You know, it's very common. People do that. People out hiking and stuff. And I'm put a blanket under it or something, but uh, all, all above it. And um, he's sleeping with a rock under his head. And then it says, then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth. And its top reached to heaven, and there were angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. What you have here, again, is a ladder into heaven, from earth to heaven. It is a gateway, okay, uh, to heaven. And um, I want to ask you this. What is that? He was given, this is a, a privilege and an honor to see what the Lord allowed him to see. And as I said to you at the beginning of the message, there are some kooky, kooky, I mean, in the church and outside the church, interpretations. I mean, people in the occult, and now people in the church calling, saying that there are portals that we can enter into, right in the middle of worship services, we can enter into these portals and go into heaven. And there's people saying, you know, this nut up in Toronto and talks about being taken up into heaven and he met this angel, I and mean, this is a prosperity preacher, so he met this angel named Minty Angel, his name was Minty because he was green, and he had a dollar sign on his chest. And, um, you know, it's all just, just crazy, crazy stuff. And, uh, I mean, there are others in the UFO crowd, they take this and say, this was the beam of light that beamed Jacob up onto the spaceship, and this is what Jacob is experiencing. They take the passages like when Elijah was taken up in a chariot, a fire, that it was a spaceship that came and, and took him up. When Ezekiel saw the, you know, the, his vision, it was spacemen. I believe what people are seeing is not extraterrestrials, they're extra-dimensionals, and they're actually angelic beings, and that's what these UFO sightings that are, that are happening in mass right now. Um, Jesus said people would be looking up in the end times and they would be frightened by the things they see in the sky. And I think that those things, they are, they are angels. They are not um, little green men from Alpha Centauri or from Mars. But um, what, what Jacob is seeing here, and let me, let me explain, best interpreter of scripture is what? Scripture. Watch this. This is this is powerful. In John chapter one, verse forty-three through fifty-one. Okay, and actually, I'm going to read the first uh, through verse fifty here. You're going to read this. I'm going to read this, and you're going to say, "What does this have to do with what Jacob is seeing in Genesis chapter twenty-eight?" The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, "Follow me." Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, and Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, "We have found." Him who uh, Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. We, we found them aside. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, and he said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. And Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. He's taking a siesta underneath the fig tree, and of course, Jesus, in his power, he saw that. Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Mm. Right? Look at that. You shall see hereafter heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So Jacob's ladder, Jacob's stairway. What is Jacob's stairway? It's Yeshua. <laughs> we call it as it's a theophany of Jesus. A theophany of God. 
you know, if you understand, if you understand the concept of theophanies, in the Old Testament there are multiple theophanies. We talk about Christophanies, anthropomorphisms, the angel of the Lord appearing and speaking, okay? It is what is called an anthropomorphism. No, there is what is called a theophany. In the Old Testament there are multiple theophanies. I'll give you a, a couple of them. In Exodus, and let me read this to you, Exodus 13, 21, and the Lord went before them by day in the pillar of a cloud. The pillar of a cloud is a theophany of God. It's his leading. And uh, led them uh, the way, and by night, in a pillar of fire, to give them light to go by by day and night. The alchemy, it's, it's, it's a manifestation of the presence of God. That is what essentially a, a, a theophany is, a visible manifestation of God. The pillar of fire over the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, essentially, is again a theophany. When you go through, you go through the scripture, I'll just touch on a, a few of them. Ezekiel's vision, okay, that fantastic vision that you see in Ezekiel chapter 1, and again it's repeated in chapter 11, is a theophany of God. When you look at Isaiah's vision in Isaiah chapter 6, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, it is a theophany. And what you have here in this dream by, by Jacob, that Jacob has in Genesis 28, is it is the theophany of the Lord. Who is the stairway to God? Who is, right, what, what, did you look, what did Jesus say in John 14, 6? I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. He, he is the doorway. He is the stairway. And, and Jacob here is getting, again, he's experiencing this theophany. He's getting a preview of the Lord. He brings us, essentially, to the Father. I just want to stress this, and I'm going to wrap up this message tonight you know, with this in a moment. The experience that Jacob is having is an experience that everyone has the opportunity to have, not only once when you were born again, but every day. You have the opportunity to experience Jacob's stairway and have communion with God and come into the presence of the Father through the Son. And he's given us, he's given us that Jacob experience. And it's, it's here, it's here for you. It's here for you every day. Now, the fourth thing I want you to see here, so you have God's covenant blessing upon Jacob. So here he is, he's standing in this vision before the Lord and the Lord gives him this blessing and behold, the Lord stood above it and that's Yeshua standing above it. It's the pre-incarnate form, okay, of, of Yeshua, the Hamashiach, the Savior. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. And it was like that, I am. You know why? Because Abraham's still alive. Isaac is still alive at this time. But Abraham is still alive in heaven with the Father. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Now there is, again, the renewal. He promised the land to Abraham. He promised the land to Isaac. He's promised the land to Jacob. So when President Trump said the embassy should be moved to Jerusalem and the Islamic world and all the uh, fakes in this world started screaming and yelling about it, whose land is it? It's not the Palestinians' land. It's the Jews' land. It's Jacob's descendants. It's their land. It's not our land. It's a Gentile. It's the Jews' land. It's their land. They can argue all they want about who, who deserves to be there. I'm telling you, God's going to make the final decision. He's going to make the final decision. And Messiah will rule there for a thousand years during the millennial kingdom. And then there will be a new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven in the new heaven and new earth. And it will not be uh, the United Nations that determines that. <laughs> nor the Palestinians, nor anybody else. Verse 14. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, and shall spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all families of the earth shall be blessed. We are blessed. The, the, the fighting against the Jewish people is totally demonic. In fact, you want to see one of the greatest... You, you want something to increase your belief in the authority of Scripture, just look at the persecution of the Jewish people. It doesn't make sense outside of Scripture that these people have been persecuted. They have been hounded from day one. They have been, they have been you know, killed and murdered. There have been attempted genocides. They have been basically thrown out of countries over and over again, hundreds and hundreds of times. Why? Because they are God's promised people. And that through them would come the promise of Messiah. 
And that would bring a blessing to each and every family upon the earth. And we are blessed because of that. And this is speaking of us. And in verse 15, Behold, I am with you. And this is beautiful. Behold, I am with you. And I will keep you wherever you go. And will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. And I just want you to notice that, because this is God. This is a covenant promise that God is making to Jacob. And Jacob, Jacob is a half-hearted God. I'm going to show you his, his conversion here in just a second. And he is half-hearted. He's a mugbutt. Okay? Jacob is a mugbutt. He's got his mug in front of God, and he's got his butt in the world. And he, he's, not, he's, not, he's not sold out to, to God here. But God is making a covenant promise with him, and notice that, Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go. And God promises that to us. God is faithful. He may be unfaithful. God is never unfaithful. He is always true. And our faith, our unfaithfulness cannot nullify his faithfulness. Jesus makes the promise of, you know, in, in, in multiple times, but in Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, with the Great Commission, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely what? I am with you always. If you, if you have come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've been born again, you've been forgiven of your sins, and he has given to you the Holy Spirit, he's going to be with you right through the, this entire life and for all eternity. And, and you may fall short, and you will fall short. And, and there are times where you're going to fail him, but he will not fail you. And he will be faithful to the very end. All right, number five here. So this is Jacob's realization of Revelation. You know the realization of Revelation? You ever have realizations of Revelation? I have realizations of Revelations all the time. I'm going through something, I'm studying something, God is revealing things to me, sometimes directly through the Scripture, and a bunch of experiences that are happening in my life, and all of a sudden I wake up and I have the realization that there has been a revelation given to me here. So it says, that J Jacob awoke from his sleep. And look at what he says. He says, surely the Lord is in this place. <laughs> His mind has just been, I mean, he's blown away, and I did not know it. And by the way, that's, it's a little scary there. <clears throat> that we could be in a place where God is manifesting himself, and we're totally oblivious of, uh, you know, of it, because we're focused. He's probably focused on worrying about, he's worrying about his brother coming after him, and he's worried about, hey, I don't know what's ahead for me, I don't know Uncle Laban, I don't know what's going to be, you know, lying ahead up there in Syria for me. So he's not really focused on God. And here it is, God is revealing himself in such a powerful way. And again, he says, surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. Sunday was a very powerful day here at Living Word. But there are many people who came here Sunday probably didn't have an experience of God. Some of us were just totally flawed at what God was doing here. I, I had a powerful, very, I think I had one of the most powerful worship experiences here in 15 minutes, and I didn't get in here until a little bit late because I was upstairs with the kids. And when I came in here, I just had such a powerful experience with God. And Lenny and the worship team and Kim and everything they were doing, there was such an anointing here that it was very powerful. And I had an experience, I just had a very powerful experience in the presence of God. And yet I believe there, there are people sitting here who just walked out here and nothing happened to them. And surely the Lord is in this place and they didn't know it. And then notice what it says here, because when you experience God, when you have an experience of the Lord, he was afraid. And, and this is not the, the fear of being struck down and killed by God. It is an awe. And the next word that follows... How awesome is this place? It's an awe and wonder of God. It's getting your mind blown by God. It says, this is none other than the house of God. That is the, the word for Bethel. And it's the gate of heaven. But he has had a Yeshua experience here. In Yeshua's pre-incarnate state. And he is just blown away. If you've ever experienced a storm, you can look at that. Some people have never experienced a tornado. But people who experience tornadoes or hurricanes or lightning, there is this awe. Now, there is a terror that comes with that. 
The beauty, the beauty and the difference between experiencing God, there is an experience of the power of God that I think is, is, is powerful. And it, listen, it could be in the most quiet place. You could be in the most quiet place and have this powerful experience of God where, let me tell you, you're experiencing wonder and awe in your heart that is unlike anything that you've ever experienced before. And in that, and in that awe, and in that wonder, and in that fear, there's a reverence and a fear that you're in a very, you're in the presence of a very special person, the Holy One, the Creator of all things. And in the midst of that, there's an embrace that comes on our souls, and suddenly you're in the hands of the eternal God, and they're gentle, right? How many of you have had that? Have had the, you know, you've had this experience. I've had this experience multiple, multiple times in my life. The power of God, and I'm like, it's unlike anything I've ever experienced. And then all of a sudden, you're in this place where you're loved. Yeah. So the sixth thing I want you to show you is Jacob's conversion, the last thing here. And so it says in verse 18, Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head, and he set up a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He's, he's creating an altar here. The oil is, is an oil of uh, consecration, sanctification. And he called the name of that place Bethel, that is again uh, the house of God, and it had been previously named Luz. And we don't really have a definition for Luz, but Luz was a, it was almost like a capital city of the Canaanites. And this is a beautiful thing because what you see here is God's taking back territory. It's a pagan place of pagan worship. And now, it has been revealed to Jacob that there's a doorway to God, a stairway to God there. And he sets up this altar and he worships God. By the way, this place of, of Luz and a Canaanite city, remember the connection of the Canaanites going back. There's actually a connection there with the Canaanites and the Nephilim, the demonic beings, the offspring of Satan. And then here is, here is his conversion. And watch this, because again, it's... It's a true conversion, but he's not really sold out. And if you look, it says, and Jacob made a vow saying, if. Notice the word if and then. If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then. See that? If God does what I want him to do, then the Lord shall be my God. Hmm. And the stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a, a tenth to you. Notice that. If you do what I want you to do, then... Hey, I want you to look at me for a second. Watch this. When you, think, when you came to Jesus. Don't tell me about where you are now. When you came to Jesus, how many of you came to Jesus... Purely because you were convinced that he was the Lord, Lord, and you just wanted to devote yourself 100% to serving him because he was the Lord. Yeah. How many of you came to the Lord really out of selfish reasons? You wanted to be saved. You wanted peace. You wanted joy. Now, listen, there's a, there's a, a false doctrine in the church. They say, when you first receive Jesus as Savior, and later on you accept him as Lord, you can't separate him. I understood he was Lord. But the main reason I came to him was because I wanted to be forgiven of all my sins. So it was really, I was motivated. To, it was out of selfishness. I wanted to be saved. I wanted all those sins blotted out. I, I had a conviction that, hey, you know what? The Holy Spirit convicted me that I was going to hell. And I wanted to be saved from hell. And so if I could have complete forgiveness by putting my faith in Jesus Christ, right? I did that. But think about that. Because when we come to him, now, we come to him and we come to know him. And the Holy Spirit begins to convict us and lead us and guide us. And then all of a sudden now, his lordship becomes bigger and bigger in our lives. And yet, it's there when we're saved. But how many people, I've asked this question to people, honestly. I have never had a person say to me, I just came to the Lord purely because, you know, I just wanted to serve him. I wanted to give him. I've never had anybody say that to me. We come to him because we want to be saved. We want peace. We want to be delivered. We want to experience joy. And that's kind of the experience here that Jacob has. And what you're going to see is a beautiful thing because Jacob is going to go on somewhat in this carnal way, kind of struggling between the spirit and the flesh. 
And eventually, and really what, what's happening with Jacob, and you're going to see this in the next weeks, he's wrestling with God. And until you really surrender to him, you're going to be wrestling with him. And he literally has a wrestling match with God at one point. And he finally surrenders to him. And he makes Yahweh the king of all his life. And that is where the real blessing happens. But he's, um, he's really kind of ready. It's kind of a carnal thing, right? If you bless me, then... Oh, we'll see. Yeah. Well, I'm going to give you here a wrap-up. And again, we all have this experience. It's, at our, it, it, it's, it's right there before us that we can experience the Father through the Son. And He is that stairway that we can come to God through. Jesus said this in John chapter 6, 46. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. And it's essentially right through the Son that we experience the Father. The Father's invisible. When you, have, when you have these teachers saying that they have seen the Father, that immediately should set you up that they have not. No one has seen the Father, except the Son. And we experience the Father through the Son. And that's why, again, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And again, not just once when we were converted, we have this opportunity to experience the Father through the latter, who is Yeshua, the HaMashiach, the Savior. And we have access to the very throne room of the Father through the Son. And we can have the Bethel experience. The Bethel experience is something that, that we can have, and have it on an ongoing basis, and have it daily, as we seek and we come to commune with the Lord. And we can experience that touch, that forgiveness, that love, that compassion. Have him speak to our hearts and commune with him. So remember, remember Genesis 28. Remember the Bethel experience because it's there for you. And you can have that on a daily basis. Would you bow your heads and we'll close in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for your word. I thank you, Lord God, for this, this great Lord God. Um, example that we have through the life of Jacob that, Father, we can come through the Son and, Father, we can know you. We can commune with you. Father, we can experience your incredible love and grace. And, Lord God, we can sit right there at the foot of your throne. And, Lord God, we can know you. And, Father God, there is nothing better than that. There is nothing greater than that. And I pray, Lord God, that we all here tonight would have the boldness to know that we can come to the Father through the Son, who has made a way for us through his death and his resurrection, and have that communion with you. And as we pray to you tonight, Lord, and we just talk to you about things, Lord, may we just have a sense that you are right here with us and we're talking to you, not talking into the air, not praying into the air, but that, Lord, we're talking to our Heavenly Father who wants for us, Lord God, the very best, and Lord, who knows the very best for us, and has the power to give us the very best. So hear our prayers tonight, Lord God, and be glorified in Jesus' name, amen. Let's break up into small groups and go into prayer.